The book of Acts is a, is a book about uh, God's heart of mission. It's a story of how uh, God calls and uh, chooses to use men and women like you and me to call other men and women like you and me to see that Jesus is a very good king who is worthy of our trust and our allegiance. Uh, it's a story of salvation and of rescue as we see God drawing more and more people from different backgrounds and tongues and ages and genders uh, to Christ. It's a story of grace and uh, mercy that ought to give us massive confidence uh, that God is at work in growing his church and saving our neighbours. But, but having said all that, I'm also very aware that whenever we as a church come to the book of Acts uh, and, uh, and think about what it can teach us about our own part in God's mission unstoppable as we seek under God to be faithful in our task to make and teach and send out disciples of Jesus. Uh, that often rather than being an encouragement to us, what ends up happening is that you end up feeling beaten up and guilty. Uh, caused either by the early disciples and their commitment and their success, or by me and my zeal for us to be a missional church that can so easily turn a passage of deep grace into a legalistic guilt trip. And so if I've made you feel like that, then I'm sorry. I do want to say uh, from the outset this morning that, that my prayer is that Acts 18, far from being a guilt trip to mission, will actually serve as an encouragement to you, as it has been to me as I've dwelt in it over the past uh, couple of weeks. And so with that said, the first thing that I want us to see from Acts 18 this morning is, is simply this. Uh, chill, but keep going. Chill, but keep going. Because just look at verse 9. Uh, Paul knows what it feels like to want to give up in mission and ministry. He's clearly having doubts about his God-given mission. He's fearful, right? But we're told. That's why in verse 9, God has to tell him, do not be afraid, but keep going. Uh, Paul writes elsewhere that when he arrived in Corinth, he did so with much fear and trembling, with a feeling of total weakness. Which, of course, if you know anything about Paul's recent experiences in the towns of Philippi and Thessalonica that we've been looking at, where he's been beaten up, where he's been run out of town, then as he approaches the city of Corinth, his fears and doubts become totally understandable. Because, well, Corinth was a fairly new and flashy city that had been founded by Julius Caesar himself. And it still had a pride within it and within its citizens of, of, of being something special. It was a city full of somebodies. Full of the nouveau riche who had got in on the ports and trade routes that served Corinth and had made their fortunes. It was a city that looked down on humility and simplicity and favoured wisdom and highbrow polished nobility. It was a city that the Christian Paul didn't fit in with, actually. Again, in his letters to the Corinthians later on, we're told that he came to this proud city with, with no flashiness. We're told that he came with no brilliant communication skills, with no highbrow wisdom. He didn't fit in with what they valued and what they elevated. No, instead, he came as a manual laborer, who to a culture who viewed working with your hands as unimpressive and insignificant, wasn't very impressive. He came with a gospel about a man who suffered and died, not who was powerful and who triumphed in battle. And so Corinth was an alien city to Paul, an alien culture. And of course, Corinth was also a city that was most famous for its unbridled attitudes of sex and debauchery. As the temple prostitutes were sent out from the temple of Epaphrodite, the goddess of love, each night for the pleasure of the city's inhabitants. And this reputation for its sexual hedonism was so widespread that in fact, the name Corinth, became synonymous for immorality. immorality. Uh, the Greek word, I won't pronounce it right, but the Greek word uh, Corinthizomai became a common word ac across the whole world for any kind of immorality. So famous was their immorality. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's that kind of town. 
And Paul knows his job is to call the people of Corinth to renounce their false gods and call them to repentance and faith in Christ. And so when you remember Paul having already been arrested, threatened, run out of numerous towns, you can begin to capture the fearful, weak and apprehensiveness that Paul must be feeling as he heads towards Corinth. No wonder he's arrived with fear and trembling, is it? Oh, Paul knows many of our weaknesses. He knows our doubts when it comes to mission here, doesn't he? He's clearly not feeling great about the task at hand. And yet in verse 9, just before we consider how the Lord encourages Paul in his task, it's important that we first acknowledge what the Lord Jesus doesn't say to Paul. Because despite his fears, despite his hurts, despite his experiences, Jesus doesn't say to Paul here, Hey, Paul, look, I know it's hard. So don't worry about what I said to you about taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. When you get to Corinth, do you know what? Just have a holiday. And there's no need to talk about me there. Get yourself a cocktail, enjoy the culture, and just, just blend in. Go see the sights. There's lots to be seen there. It's a new city. You'll, you'll love it. Despite being hard, despite your fears. No. He doesn't say that. It, it instead, he says, hey, Paul, you have to go on speaking. Hey, Paul, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's fearful. But the wonderful truth is that there are those in this city, verse 9 and 10, who are my people. And the inference is, isn't it, that it's going to be through Paul heralding the gospel, verse 11, that men and women, like verse 8, Crispus and his whole household, and the many other Corinthians there in verse 8, believe and are baptized. It is through Paul opening up the Bible in verse 4, his reasoning. Or verse 5, his proclamation of the scriptures. Or verse 11, his teaching the word of God, that men and women in this proud, sinful, immoral, flashy city become believers. As they're saved from the judgment that their sins deserve and welcomed into God's eternal kingdom. As they follow the gracious, merciful, benevolent King Jesus. And so what I want to say... And I hope in a moment I'll go on to encourage you in this as well. But I, 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 I want to say, before encouraging you, despite our fears, despite our feelings of inadequacy, despite having a gospel message that cuts against the grain of a town like Stockport and a city like Manchester that is proud and self-sufficient and in all sorts of ways immoral, we must keep going. The command to go, the command to speak, the command to show others how Jesus is the Christ, the saviour that we all need, still holds true. And God is still at work in saving people. That's wonderful news. God is still at work in saving people. And God in Jesus says to Paul, as he does to you and me this morning, keep going so more people might receive my grace. But as he does so, in his grace and mercy, he also equips and empowers and encourages Paul uh, as he speaks. And so there's just a couple of other things from this passage that I hope will do the same for us as we continue on our mission to make, teach, and send our disciples of Jesus. Uh, the first of which is this. As you embark on God's great, great commission, you can trust and rest in God's timings. Trust and rest in God's timings. So, so look at verse 2. As Paul arrives in Corinth, Luke, the author of Acts, tells us that Paul finds Aquila and his wife Priscilla. And at this point, it's likely that Aquila and Priscilla are already uh, Christians. I think if they were converted through Paul's ministry, Luke would have probably uh, told us about how uh, that happened in the book of Acts. So, so we, we can assume that they're already Christians. And so here we go. Paul walks into town. Fearful and trembling. And who does he find? A Christian couple who, verse 3, in God's wonderful provision and timing, happened to have exactly the same profession as Paul. But they were tent makers by trade. And they generously open up their business for Paul to work with them in order for him to fund his ministry. What encouragement for the terrified Paul this must have been. As he walks into Sin City, he meets brothers and sisters in Christ who can offer him a place to stay and a job in their business. That's provision, right? 
Uh, but there's more than that, because look why, uh, why Aquila and Priscilla are there in the first place. Verse 2, because Claudius, that's the emperor of Rome, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Priscilla and Aquila are there because through persecution they'd been dispersed. And so they'd had to relocate to Corinth. Uh, what happened, as uh, historians tell us, is that the Jews in Rome had all fallen out with one another. Uh, so there were factions and differing parties who were constantly uh, bickering and fighting. There's some evidence that it was probably them fighting over Jesus and who the different factions thought that he was. But whatever they were fighting about, Claudius, the emperor, just got fed up with the Jews fighting. And he was like, just get out. Leave the city. Kick them out of Rome. Uh, so we've seen it from Paul's side, but now imagine being Aquila and Priscilla in these days. Your house, your business, your social life, all uprooted by the edict of, and bigotry of the empire. I mean, that's got to be heartbreaking, right? You've got to have big questions of what's going on as you're kicked out of the city that you've, you've been dwelling in and living in. But why us? This sucks. I, I don't understand. Everything we've worked for, all the roots we've put down have come to nothing. But, but, then, but then you fast forward a few months or years and you start to rebuild in a new city when the Lord God brings across your path the Apostle Paul and you get to provide for him and support him and go on mission with him at just the point in his journey that he needed you and your skills and your profession. And then we, we didn't read this, but just look down to verse 18. Aquila and Priscilla then join Paul in his mission trip to Ephesus. And they stay there and they trained, verse 24, right at the bottom, Apollos to take the gospel, verse 27, to Achaia. Do you see, as you, as you zoom out on the events of, these couples, of this couple's life, well, this so-called chance meeting in Sin City leads to the gospel flourishing and growing both in Corinth and in Ephesus in Achaia. Do you see, and in the context of Acts, where we've seen God's timings at work at time and time again, Luke's account of these events are absolutely peppered, not with, not with chance, but with the sovereignty and purposes of God, bringing all things together in order to grow his kingdom so that people can be saved. And then look at verse 5, won't you? Because this is kind of a side note, but I, I, I think it's related, and I think it's really important for lots of us to hear this morning. I think we need to hear this so we don't beat ourselves up too much. But do you notice here that there are, there are different seasons of ministry for Paul as life circumstances change? So look what happens in verse 5. Silas and Timothy arrive from Macedonia. And as they do, well, the English translation here of the ESV is, isn't brilliant. It's not particularly clear here. But, but the NIV, a different English translation, puts it like this. Verse 5. When Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. In other words, in verse 5, Paul gave up the tent-making business to focus on preaching. And he was able to do that because we're told elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 11 and Philippians 4, if you're taking notes, that Silas and Timothy brought with them a financial gift from the Macedonian churches to fund Paul and his ministry. And why do, we, why do we need to hear this? Why am I telling you about this incidental little detail? Because I want you to all hear that in the sovereignty of God, circumstances, life circumstances, change. There will be times where we as individuals and as a church have an abundance of resources, whether time, finance, relationships, capacity or energy, to enable us to devote ourselves to ministry and mission. And there will be times when, quite simply, we don't. And we need to rely on others to help us. And we just need to be realistic about that and honest about that. And I mean realistic. Paul didn't say, I have a new job now, so I can't do anything. He still went to the synagogue on each Sabbath. His job wasn't an excuse to stop missional endeavor. But he was willing to adapt and accept the sovereignty of God in using Paul to grow the church, even in and through Paul's life circumstances. Some of you need to hear this this morning, that life circumstances change, time, capacity, resources for mission change. Jobs come along, kids come along, illness comes along, exams come along, and timings change, and friends, that's okay. Okay. 
If the only people you see in a week are your kids as you wrestle with raising them, delight that you get to tell them about Jesus. If you're exhausted by life and the idea of mixing with anyone is just a horrific thought for you right now, then the Lord has maybe put you in a place where what you can do is devote yourself to praying for others in missional endeavors, partner with them in that way. If you're in an office where actually you're quite liked and listened to, then jump on that opportunity and delight that God has placed you there. If, if you've got real close friendships where sharing life and the gospel is easy, then delight that you get to speak. Listen, Christian, God has put you in his sovereignty exactly where you are for a reason. You, you might question it. You might not understand it. You might be delighted by it. But one day when you and me are enjoying a catch-up in whatever the heavenly equivalent of Barretto Lounge is, we're going to share some stories of a zoomed-out life that are filled with awe and wonder at just how clever and wise and mind-blowing intricate God was in placing us in just the right places at just the right times to grow his kingdom and save a people. But chill. Chill. All you need to do as you pave your way through this life is in every circumstance be faithful to God as he calls you and me to join in with his mission unstoppable. And what that looks like will look different for all of us. It might look different tomorrow as it does today. Chill and trust and rest in God's timings. As we trust that God's word will do God's work. Because that's the second thing we learn from this passage that I hope will encourage you. And I, I think, again, it's a massive pressure release for us. See, I don't know about you, but, but when I sit in, in your place and I hear people like me banging on about evangelism and mission, then I feel massively ill-equipped for the task. And I have a degree in some of this stuff. I get nervous. I get anxious. I put a huge amount of pressure on myself and my performance. If the people who I'm speaking with don't become Christians, then I figure that's on me that I've failed in some way. Just look at verse 5 again. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. See what Paul is telling us here as he storms out of the synagogue and sets up camp next door? Which in itself is quite cool, I think, that, you know, out of the people who reject you and you just set up a shop next door that's quite fun he's telling us though that, that far from stopping at his feet the bug for rejecting or accepting jesus lies with the hearer and not the speaker now of course the bible tells us elsewhere that there are ways to communicate with grace and with gentleness and seasoned with salt we've been hearing throughout this acts series that there are things we might want to pull on to help us to explain how and why jesus is the one who died in our place for our sin to reconcile us to god that there might be training we want to do so that we feel better equipped and certainly we'll want to pray for our listeners. But our job, verse 9, is simply to unpack the scriptures as we speak of Jesus and then trust that where God's people are, under God's sovereignty, at just the right time, they will hear and respond. Friends, you're not responsible for their response. Doesn't that take a weight off your shoulders? We simply need to hold out the word of God, trusting that it will do God's work. Christchurch Stockport doesn't have a promise, a tally chart somewhere where you get a bonus for the number of people that you lead to Christ. We've probably thought about it at some point, but we don't have it. We won't celebrate your powers of persuasion or your articulate rhetorical styles. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll honour you and make much of you for being faithful to God in speaking of Christ. We will celebrate your, your courage and your sacrifice in doing so, as we did with, with Ben last week. We will seek to be your Aquila and your Priscilla as we partner with you in the task in whatever way we can. We will pray and we will support and we will resource and we will train you if that's what you need and want. But whether your faithfulness leads to gospel fruit or not is ba not based on you. God's word will do God's work in God's way. And if people choose to reject Christ, then that's on them. Which, if you're not a Christian here today, is something worth thinking about. How are you getting on with listening 
to and engaging with Jesus. Christchurch.port, chill and trust that God's word will do God's work, God's ways. As you trust, finally, that God has people in this town. So look at verse 10. And remember again that we're in the, uh, the, the context of Paul needing encouragement to keep going as he seeks to tell people of Sin City about Jesus. And the temptation as he looks around the city at the multitude of temples to false gods, as he's experienced the proud self-sufficiency and boastful success, as he's witnessed the rife and very obvious sexual immorality, the temptation must have been to think, well, I should probably leave this place because let's be honest, there is far from verse 25, the way of the Lord, as it's possible to be. And yet, verse 9 and 10, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Uh, for I am with you. That's a promise that the Lord Jesus tells us at the Great Commission. I am with you and no one will attack or harm you. That's very specific, I think, for Paul at this point. For I have many in this city who are my people. In other words, Paul, as you look out on the great town city of Corinth, don't be quick to dismiss this city. Even in their sin, even in their pride, even in their rejection of you, even here in Corinth, there are those who will hear my word and who will respond with faith. Which again should come as an encouragement to us, right? Because sure, Stockport isn't Corinth. But nevertheless, who hasn't looked at our town or our office or our school or our friends or the person who we get to talking to at that random event and thought, well, there's just no way they're going to become a Christian. So I won't bother. I might as well just bypass them and go and look for someone I deem more likely, I deem more likely to respond to the gospel. But what God is telling us here is that his grace is big enough and sufficient enough and attractive enough for even the citizens of Corinth. He's saying that he's a God of rescue, that he's a God of the multitude, and he's a God of miracles. And that he, in his sovereignty, has earmarked people, even in Corinth, to be saved. And so if God is bothered enough and powerful enough that he can save the synagogue ruler in verse 8, and a, a bunch of other folk who, to be honest, when you read through like Paul's letters to the Corinthian church, are just a messy, sinful broken hotchpotch of people like you wouldn't pick these people to form a church with who are going to cause paul they, they, they cause him all sorts of headaches over what christ-like living looks like but if christ can and does save me messy sinful people like corinth then who are you and i to suppose he doesn't have people in our offices and our schools and our sports teams and our orchestras and our bars and our families and our friendship groups too The problem is, though, which is really annoying, but God's sovereign, so I'm not going to wave my little puny fist at him. You notice that God doesn't tell Paul who they are. Like, that would be so much more easy, wouldn't it? Like, go to number 27 Straight Street and, you know, go to that bar there. And there are times where God does do that for Paul, but in this circumstance, he doesn't. No. He says he has people in the town, which must have been brilliant news for Paul and a proper encouragement. But then Paul's job. And now our job is to simply speak, trusting God's word to reach God's people in God's timing. In order to bring about the salvation of many. Some will reject us. Some will slander and come after us. They're actually not rejecting us, they're rejecting the Lord Jesus. And to them we must say with a heavy, heavy heart, this isn't a proud moment that Paul says this, your blood be on your head, I am innocent, I, I, I've told you the gospel, I've held out the word of God to you. But Christian, think about it like this. We've got a sovereign God who is drawing to himself a people, who is missional, who wants people to come to himself, who we've seen can work times and places and people into just the right place at just the right time. Which means the very fact that you are sitting in a church in Stockport among other believers with a God-given mission to go and tell, implies to us that God has people in this town. 
in his sovereignty, he has brought you and me here to, in his wonderful and perfect missional timings to be faithful. To hold out the word of God as we are able to those who cross our paths. And then let God go to work through his word in their lives. He didn't give us a list of who they are. We get the joy of finding that out on the roller coaster that is mission. But I just want to say this morning, don't, just chill. Don't beat yourself up. And keep going. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we can all, or many of us certainly in this room, can testify of your goodness and grace and timings in placing people in our path who at just the right time, in just the right way, held out the word of God to us to enable us to respond to be able for you to work in us by our spirit, that our eyes might be open to the glory and majesty of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you and praise you for that. And Lord God, we thank you that you have put us in a town like Stockport and called us to hand out this wonderful gospel of grace to the people of this town. Father, we want to be honest, like, like Paul you know our hearts, often they are fearful. Often they are reluctant. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, empower us, encourage us, help us in whatever situation and circumstance that we're in, to be those who can faithfully hold out the word of God to others. Father, we know our town of Stockport uh, and beyond needs you. And so we beg that you would use us and other Christians in this town to proclaim your grace and mercy. Save the people for yourself. Help us to know how to encourage one another, how to spur one another on, how to drive one another forward in mission. Thank you for saving us. Amen.